I like how one of the things on this diagram is just labeled Cosmic Ray. Welcome to Tech Tales. I'm Corbin Davenport. And I'm Cody Toombs. And today we're starting another mini-series. We're talking about Voyager 1 and 2, which were unmanned space probes launched in the 1970s that were pretty important for science and how we look at the universe and how we look at ourselves. And there's a pretty interesting story to how it was or how the two probes were developed and launched into space and then had things go wrong and then they they still kept trucking and they're still going it's been like 40 years but they're they're still technically both working so cody what what do you know about voyager one and two how are you familiar with these i know very little tiny bits about it but strangely they never covered it when i was in school which it actually would have been a perfect time to cover Voyager 1. And then I just kind of missed a lot of that news as the years went by. I know I heard bits and pieces and I kind of picked up little things here and there, but yeah, I never followed it. Yeah, that's kind of where I was at before researching this. Like I I knew like the, the top level stuff of like, oh yeah, they explored the outer planets and they've left the solar system about 17 times right but i I didn't know much beyond that and i was uh, pleasantly surprised to find out that uh they're pretty interesting so that's why we're talking about them so the story of voyager one and two kind of starts in the summer of 1965 this was the middle of the space race between the united states and the soviet union over who was going to land a person on the moon first. Spoilers. It was America. Go us. We were pretty special. Yeah. But while that was going on, there was the issue of what should NASA do after that? Right? Like, you always need something to look forward to. And in the case of government agencies, you kind of need to know what you're doing a couple years ahead of time so you can request money for it. So in the summer of 1965, the National Academy of Sciences Space Science Board, wow, held a summer study of scientists at Woods Hole, Massachusetts, to plan out NASA's future after the Apollo moon landings. After this meeting, they kind of agree that NASA should shift its attention from the moon to the planets of the solar system. They're kind of thinking like, we know a lot about the moon now, like to the point where we can, we're fairly confident we can land a human on it, but we don't really know a lot about the other planets in the solar system, right? Like at, at this point in history, no spacecraft had visited any planets beyond Mars. We, we'd sent a few to Venus, which is how we found out that it's the most inhospitable place <laughs> in the solar system. <laughs> and we'd sent a few things to Mars which is how we found out it was really dead. There were probably no aliens there. Scientists recommended one of two strategies. Either NASA should do flyby missions to each of the outer planets, so Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, Uranus, and Pluto at the time. Pluto was still a planet. Team Pluto is a planet. So either do that or just do a very detailed study of Jupiter using orbiters and atmospheric entry probes. So like multiple things would be sent to just Jupiter. Because, like, there's a lot to explore with Jupiter. I, yeah, I mean, that's, that's sort of like, you, you grew up in a tiny little town and there's what you technically call a mall. And mm-hmm. you get to learn that mall pretty well. Then you visit a big city and it's like, oh, wow, they make them this big? It's actually hard to grasp just how much stuff is around Jupiter. Like it's, it, it gets called the Jovian system a lot because it's basically its own little solar system. I mean, you really couldn't have gone wrong with Jupiter, but yeah, it is. Yeah, those, it is. those are both solid ideas. The scientists also recommended that NASA would send several smaller missions with 
already tested designs, like something based on what they were already using, rather than going with these large and expensive projects that needed a lot of R&D. Because when you do really large projects, it means the follow-up takes longer. Because like you spent all your money on this one thing. The other element to that is that larger missions were more likely to be canceled by government budget changes. It's like everything in politics. And, and really, all of NASA had to basically live under the rule of politics. So uh, anybody that saw For All Mankind, you saw this play out a couple of times. After that meeting, this idea starts to crop up for something called the Grand Tour. And this is a plan that would send several spacecraft to all five of the outer planets. The main element to this plan was that it would take advantage of a planetary alignment that only occurs once every 175 years, with launch windows in 1976 and 1980. So basically, if they could launch something into space in those years, they could visit multiple planets on the same trip, which is pretty cool. The other element of this is that these probes would use something called a gravity assist, which I, I think was new at the time. I don't know how many other missions had done them at this point. But basically, it's where a spacecraft exploits a planet's gravitational field to boost its speed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, instead of just like launching from Earth and just going straight on to Saturn or whatever, they're basically like flung <laughs> into the other planets. It's the same concept that you've seen in almost every major movie and tv show about space where at some point they're like we're gonna just slingshot around such and such place yeah yeah except that's total bs scientifically speaking like star trek the voyage home <laughs> <laughs> so the cool thing about gravity assist is that it would allow this entire grand tour to take somewhere between 8 to 13 years depending on which path they took right there's like multiple paths they can choose from here compared to 30 years just for something to get to Neptune alone. Which really, and I know that this isn't technically the, the issue here, but uh, realistically, every person working on this project is like, we, we really want this thing to have a payoff before we're all dead. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Or, or at least before we all are completely retired and out of the question. So let's do the quicker one. Yeah. And there is the, the catch with gravity assist where the missions have to be flybys, right? Like you can't, you, when, when it's flung to this velocity, the probe can't like slow down later to, to like, you know, go in orbit of a planet or something. It's, it's literally shooting by. There's no slowing down. Yeah. So a little bit of a bummer, but like, that's kind of how most missions were at this point. Anyway, they're just like shooting stuff into space. And like, <laughs> if, if they get within something to take a picture of, like, that's cool. Not that I would have, not that I would have argued for this, but I swear they probably, if they'd really wanted to, they probably could have done something where like, you have the, you have it fly by, but it also drops something on the planet on the way. Yeah. Yeah, I there's probably ways they could have pulled that off, but we're also talking about technology from a lot of decades ago, yeah. and that, yeah, that, that seems pretty optimistic. We were lucky to get anything into space. Still, let's be yeah. honest. So the the funny part with this plan is that even though it's pretty ambitious, like we're sending multiple probes to visit multiple planets with this once in several lifetimes planetary alignment. It was kind of technically still a, a cost-cutting idea because you could have one probe visit multiple planets instead mm -hmm. of one for each. So, like, when you com compare it to that, it is saving a lot of money. Like, this this is the space exploration equivalent of a buy one, get one free deal. It, not only is that very true, but just imagine making that pitch when you're trying to tell a bunch of senators, hey we found a way to make this cheap yeah. by, you know, by space exploration standards. Not only can we, like, get something up there and maybe explore other planets, we're going to explore, like, lots of them, okay? 
yeah, it, that's that's kind of a good presentation. Yeah, and that's that's again going back to like what the scientists in that initial study were saying. Like, it's really difficult to fund things, <laughs> so <laughs> we need like every sort of angle we can get here. So in 1969, NASA created the Outer Planets Working Group to make some firm plans for long-range space missions to the outer solar system. The organization had representatives from all of NASA's field centers that were interested in this idea, which included the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is JPL, most people call it JPL, uh, Amos, Goddard, and Marshall, as well as the Illinois Institute of Technology Research Institute's Astro Sciences Center. Oh boy, these names. There's so many long words in this. No, seriously, some of these names, it, I love how there are re names that are repetitive. They actually include like the same word twice. Yeah, that had institute twice. I don't yeah. think you need that many. You can just say it once, Illinois. So at least we know that Illinois was not into efficiency. Yeah, not their strong suit. No. So, you know, all these agencies are kind of trying to put together some plan for a grand tour. The proposal that got the most traction was from JPL, and they called it TOPS, which stood for Thermoelectric Outer Planet Spacecraft. Even though, like, kind of the, the main element of this was, like, we're saving money, this was the opposite of that. <laughs> <laughs> so JPL's plan would have been four launches in total with a cost of around 750 to 900 million dollars plus 106 million for the launch vehicle and the idea was that two of these probes would fly to Jupiter, Saturn and Pluto in 1976 and 1977 and then the other two would go past Jupiter, Uranus and Neptune in 1979 so that covers all the planets. We got all the planets in there. It would just cost a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. And it, and it wasn't even the fact that they were doing like four launches. That was the issue. It was just that like they were doing that. And then also these probes would have been really advanced. Like they'd have a lot of sensors and, and things on them. So just everything about this was very expensive. I mean, at least that part makes sense. You want to get, you want to record as much as you can. Uh, the sheer number of them, yeah, that's overkill. yeah. Like I can, I can understand it from like a science perspective. Of it's like, all right, this will not happen again for a hundred and seventy years. Yeah, let's take advantage of this. Yeah, no, that that actually is a good point. <laughs> but also, this is a government agency, and it's hard to go for that. It, well, you still have to run this by a bunch of senators. That's that's where this whole thing just gets unless unless there's oil on one of the planets. It's really hard to go for. Yeah. So all that was going to be really expensive, and there was a problem. And that problem's name was Richard Nixon, who was elected president in January of 1969. And he had a different idea for how NASA should operate compared to previous administrations. Nixon saw NASA as kind of just another federal agency. Like, they're not really special or in any way and once americans had landed on the moon in july of 1969 he wasn't really interested in continuing human space flight beyond low earth orbit like he was like all right we went to the moon we're done now we're fine now we're, we're good so the nixon administration reduced nasa's spending in the 1971 fiscal budget by around 10 percent. it's a pretty big cut the main cut was the production of Saturn V launch vehicles for the Apollo missions was suspended. So that was the, the Saturn V was that big rocket that was used for all the moon landings. So that kind of cut off the, the moon missions right there. And there was other stuff NASA was like thinking about using those rockets for that, that never really materialized. Really, the only other thing they were used for was to launch the Skylab space station. That was really it. Uh -huh. Also, NASA's Office of Space Science and Applications had its budget reduced by $75 million, 
And that was the pool of money that the Grand Tour funding was going to come from. So that was now an issue. And also, the Nixon administration was hesitant to fund both the Grand Tour proposal and the space shuttle program. That was starting to, to materialize at this point. And both of those were really expensive. And as evidenced by the fact that we built several space shuttles, I think you can guess which one NASA went for. By December of 1971, NASA Administrator James Fletcher agreed to shelve the TOPS idea, like this you know, Ford launch behemoth thing, and he would replace it with a pair of less expensive probes based on the Mariner spacecrafts. So NASA, by this point, had already sent many of these Mariner probes to, I think Mars and Venus were the two main targets. Congress authorized funds for a single Mariner mission to Jupiter and Saturn in the fiscal budget for 1973, which had a price tag of $360 million, compared to the almost $1 billion for TOPS, if you remember. So, quite a bit cheaper. Discount space flights. Yeah, that would become one of the Voyager probes. The other one got funded later. NASA placed JPL in charge of the new Jupiter-Saturn spacecraft. It wasn't called Voyager yet. Even though the goal of this probe was just to visit Jupiter and Saturn, the scientists working on it hoped it would continue working long enough to reach Neptune too and Uranus and, and so on. So NASA requested upgraded plutonium batteries that could last more than 10 years. So I think like... a when you think of space satellites, you kind of think of like stuff that has solar panels on them. And that's how most ones around like Earth and the inner solar system work because the sun's really bright and it's um, like an unlimited power source. It's kind of cool. Yeah, sun doesn't reach quite as far when you're sending stuff way out in the deep. No, it gets, sun gets very dim. You need a different power source. So the Voyager probes would end up using like a, you know, like nuclear power basically. So now we've got the probe, we've got the energy source. So at this point, JPL and NASA start selecting which payloads and scientific instruments would be included on the spacecraft based on what scientists are interested in and, you know, what they can fit in the budget and so on and so forth. There's a lot of like scientist llama drama here with like groups of scientists trying to like push their experiment to be one of the ones that's included on Voyager. I'm I'm not getting any of that because I, I really don't care. But there's yeah. there's just, there's a lot of like scientist beef here. The one interesting decision that does get made around this point is that JPL is like insisting there needs to be cameras on the Voyager probes. It's an interesting choice at the time because a lot of these early missions are just doing like scientific measurements, like they're not really focused on, on looking at the actual planets. So there's like the, this decision you have to make of like, do you use the money and especially the weight of cameras? Do you take that and use it for more scientific stuff? Or do you go with a camera, which is not as helpful for scientific observations, but the general public mm -hmm. sure pays attention to photos more. <laughs> That was kind of controversial, but also like JPL was the one building the probe, so no one could tell them no. <laughs> <laughs> and there is the added complication that sending data over that distance, that's some uh, optimistic stuff right there. So besides all the scientific instruments and the power source and the cameras, NASA also approved a phonographic record to be attached to both Voyager probes called Sounds of Earth. <laughs> um, and th this was also called the golden record in a lot of places because it's made out of copper. So it kind of looked gold. And the entire purpose of this was, you know, Voyager one and two were going to go really fast and eventually they would leave the solar system. So they were like, this might get found by aliens if aliens exist. So we should, you know, tell them about us. And, and they're optimistic that they'll be able to play a record. <laughs> well, yeah. The contents of this recording were compiled by some prominent scientists at the time, uh, including Carl Sagan. The recording was two hours long, and it included greetings in 60 languages, 
It had samples of music from different cultures and eras. It had a lot of nature sounds. It had like animal sounds on it. And it also had 115 photos and diagrams in analog form, as well as a message from President Jimmy Carter and the Secretary (laughs) General of the United Nations. So (laughs) somewhere in space, there's a recording of Jimmy Carter saying hi. Oh, geez. What we're going to do is we're going to listen to part of that audio. Obviously, not even close to the whole thing, because I I don't want to sit here for two hours and listen to nature sounds. I might fall asleep. So... We'll just, uh, I'll just send this to you. All right, you queued up? Uh, yes, I am. Okay. Go in three, two, one, go. I mean, if you want to scare some aliens, this sounds like a good way to do it. Yeah. that uh it's a car oh okay i was gonna guess like a lawnmower or a plane You know, the aliens would hear this and go, wait, so they recorded themselves preparing to shoot this thing into space <laughs> and then put it on the yeah. ship? <laughs> Just really quickly, like, duct taped it on. Yeah. More, more rocket sounds. So, yeah, so just just a bunch of different sounds. The scientists working on Voyager were eventually organized into 11 different groups, and the group structure also meant that discoveries and research that would happen with Voyager were shared across entire teams instead of what was more common at the time, which was like individual scientists claiming these discoveries. And I'll send you a passage from... Uh, Voyager, The Grand Tour of Big Science by Andrew J. Patricia. I'm not sure how that's pronounced, but I'll send this to you and you can read it. It kind of talks about the, the scientists working on this. The idea of everyone sharing findings came to project scientist Ed Stone for the need to communicate those findings to the media. He attended the press conference of Pioneer 10 when it encountered Jupiter. Stone, who previously had worked only on Earth-orbiting missions, was impressed by the scene. He said, quote, Here was a room full of reporters wanting to know what the scientists had discovered. I mean, to me, that was incredible. Normally, there just isn't that interest in what you're doing as a scientist. And here they were, day after day, saying, Tell us what you've discovered. Tell us what you've discovered. I realized that with Voyager, we had both the opportunity and the obligation to communicate what we were discovering to help the media tell the story, but we had to do it in a scientifically credible way. End quote. Having all Voyager scientists share their data made the scientists act less as individuals and more as members of a group, as they would on a typical big science project. The initial publication of results, too, followed this big science group approach. All of the initial publications resulting from a given encounter were published in the same issue of a given journal, such as Science, Nature, or the Journal of Geophysical Research. All scientists, therefore, published at the same time, but as a group, 
That is, one paper represented the discoveries of an entire science team. There was no question of priority, Stone explained. Quote, everybody had equal priority because everybody was there at the same time, end quote. So that's kind of interesting. By this point, NASA and JPL figure out the final configuration of Voyager 1 and 2. So I'm going to send you a diagram of the Voyager spacecraft, just so you can look at it. This image and everything we're talking about and the, the record from earlier and stuff are in the show notes if you want to go look at it. I like how one of the things on this diagram is just labeled Cosmic Ray. <laughs> <laughs> it's very cool. <laughs> this, is, this is the weapon system. Yeah, yeah, this is a Voyager death ray. <laughs> We're going to blast those commies off the face of the earth with this one. <laughs> it, well, I mean, they also have the low energy charge particle. That certainly just sounds like a weapon. And yeah, like there's another one that's just labeled plasma. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's where the plasma goes. <laughs> so, you know, for, for someone not looking at the diagram, basically this is a 3.6 meter or 12 feet high gain antenna with sort of two arms coming out the sides. Most of the science instruments were located on a large boom arm that extended 2.5 meters or 8.2 feet from the, the center of the spacecraft. At the end of that boom arm was a steerable scan platform that had all the imaging and spectroscopic instruments so the idea was like they could move all the instruments without moving the whole spacecraft, which which becomes an issue later. Foreshadowing. I'm going to quickly go over the science instruments. I'm going to say all these wrong, just as a heads up. <laughs> so there's a plasma spectrometer, which measured the velocity, density, and pressure of plasma ions in space. There's a low energy charged particles experiment which uh, measured electrons, protons, and the heavier ions. There's a cosmic ray system, which I, I guess is the thing that was labeled cosmic ray, yeah, <laughs> which measured cosmic ray electron energies. There's a triaxial flux gate magtometer, or mag, I probably said that wrong, that measured the strengths of planetary and interplanetary magnetic fields. There's a plasma wave system, that observed low radio frequency uh, plasma rays. There's a planetary radio astronomy experiment that was going to study radio emissions from Jupiter and Saturn. There's a ultraviolet spectrometer that measured atmospheric properties in ultraviolet. Uh, here's one for you, Cody, is the Imaging Science System, or ISS, which had one narrow angle long focal length camera and one wide angle short focal length camera and that was that that was that camera system that JPL was like you're not we're not doing this without cameras you really had to have them yeah that's that's pretty important i think we've all we've all realized now that like that's the main way you get people excited about science it's like look at the cool pictures we took of a planet last two things there's a okay there's a there's a photo pull polar meter system that collected uh, emission intensity data and finally an infrared in inferometer spectrometer and radio meter okay we're done no more <laughs> so that's all the sciencey stuff on voyager and then so that that was all contained on that one arm basically and the other arm that's jetting from voyager that has the, the power generator on it, which contained radioactive plutonium-238 that gives off heat as it decays, and it generates power. The communications came from that high-gain antenna, and there's also a low-gain antenna for backup. Voyager 1 and 2 stored data on a tape recorder until it could be transmitted, because, you know, we're in the 70s. Uh -huh. Voyager 1 and 2 had three interconnected computers, all of which had backups for redundancy. And the, the primary system was this thing called the Computer Command System, or CCS, 
which was based on the computer that NASA built for the Viking Mars lander, which was in, in development. I think it had already landed by this point. I'm not quite sure, but that was one of the ways they, they were able to cheap out on Voyager was because they already built this really complex computer system for Viking, which is part of the reason Viking took way longer and went over budget. So they could just, you know, like take that and, and put it on Voyager. Nine times out of 10, if you can tell people, hey, we can save money by reusing this other thing it makes them happy yeah yeah and it was it was a good idea and Um, honestly it very legitimately they already they already built a lot of infrastructure for local for the for our side of that communication so right the fact that they didn't have to build an all-new system to manage that and they already had a thing out there that was effectively i'm not gonna say bug fixed because I assume there, there were still issues, but yeah, they they already knew what things they were going to have to deal with, so you know that saves them a lot of hassle. Yeah, th- this this was the very early days of building space things that need to be semi autonomous. Mm-hmm. So, like, if you are if you already had something that could kind of do that already, like, it made total sense to put that on Voyager. The other two computer systems on here was the flight data system and the altitude articulation control system. And that central computer had just under 80 kilobytes of memory. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And the software for the computer command system was originally written in Fortran 5, and then it was later ported to Fortran 77, and then eventually some code was rewritten in C. And in all of these cases... They suffered from the Windows 2000 bug. Or, sorry, not Windows 2000, but the year 2000 bug. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 1999 on Saturn was a rough time for Voyager. <laughs> <laughs> One of the kind of funny things about Voyager that I didn't know was that the spacecrafts were only named Voyager a few months before they were supposed to launch. They were usually called like either like the Jupiter-Saturn missions for the first one or... They were called Mariner 11 and 12 in a lot of places because they were basically Mariner probes. But NASA organized a competition to choose the new name, and the name Voyager was approved on March 4th, 1977. And because it was so close to launch, it's it's kind of funny when you go back, a lot of news coverage and papers and stuff about the Voyager probes still call it Mariner 11 and 12, or or sometimes Voyager 11 and 12. You know, it's really good that they didn't have the internet yet because you you and I both know these would have been, ended up being called Spacey McSpace Satellite. <laughs> yeah. Saturn McSpace. Saturn <laughs> Saturn Face. Yes. That's true. We hadn't ruined things yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Except Vietnam. <laughs> oh. I had to sneak in a Nixon joke somewhere, Cody. So on that note, that's where we're going to leave it for this episode. The next episode, we're going to talk about Voyager 1 and 2 actually launching and their first discoveries and the first wave of technical problems because all this stuff was really complicated and it didn't always work well. Cody, do you have anything you'd like to plug? Uh, Well, everyone is, of course, welcome to find me on Twitter. My handle is at Cody underscore Tombs. Yeah, go go follow Cody. That's actually required if you've made it this far. You have to go follow <laughs> Cody now. And it's okay, because he tweets like once a month, so you might not even notice. Honestly, I don't think I'm even tweeting that often these days. <laughs> Stick around. We're coming back to Voyager. Uh, hopefully soon. I, I expect so, yeah. Uh, we will definitely get the next episode up before both Voyager probes shut down. <laughs> <laughs> I have until 2025.